Well, here we are. 60 years ago. I had made up my mind that <clears throat> I was going to show what we looked like 60 years ago. That is the only man in my life that I had ever loved, ever. Oh, I liked and had crushes, but nothing like loving this one. Through the years, both of us had to come through a lot of things because most of us only see things on our side. We never take a look at what it's like for that side. And sometimes we think, well, he started it, she started it, so therefore it's not my fault. Yeah, but it's you're the one that keeps it up. You're the one that keeps it going. You're the one that allows all of that bitterness and resentment and remembrance of the, all the wrong things to rise up. <clears throat> and it comes out of your mouth, out of the abundance of the heart speaketh the mouth. And it comes out of your mouth. And yes, even though I know that it's true, like God had once revealed to me, pain speaks. If you're hurting a lot and you come out and tell what's hurting you, uh, you're speaking through the pain. But a lot of times you're not speaking through the pain. You're speaking through the desire to see that other person suffer what you suffered, know what you know, go through what you went through. And you figure if they did go through that, that they would be a better person, they would change. But what good would it do you? Understand that if you force a person to submit to you, what good are they to you? What good are they in life to anything? If you can grab a hold of them and force them into subjection and make them what you want and then lie on God and say, God did that. He's the one who told me to do it. That is lying, making a lie, and be lying God. Because God never forced you. So therefore, he will never force that person. Or, you know, maybe you loved them when you married them. And you couldn't seem to live without them. Some of you knew to pray, and some of you were like me. You didn't know to pray. You knew nothing. All you knew was you were in love with someone and you had never been in love before. And although you were 20 years old, you didn't have all that much time that you had been able to be in the world because a lot of time you, you were locked up and you just, you didn't have enough time. And when you got your freedom, oh my goodness, it was unbelievable. But I have to say, I was very fortunate. Because although I did have some time that I was able to uh, understand what men were all about in the sense of going out once in a while with them, none of them, absolutely none of them, could compare with him. They couldn't match up to his looks. They could not match up to the way he was. And I started on my journey to completely destroy the things that I loved in him. Oh, yes. I didn't know I was doing that. I didn't understand that. You figure 60 years ago, without having a, a father that can t sit you down and teach you things and tell you things and talk to you the way you needed to talk to and you didn't have any friends because you weren't allowed to have them. And whatever friends you had betrayed you. And you didn't have the mother that could help you. She could love you, but she could not help you. Because she couldn't even help herself. So there you are, married. And it happened.
happened so fast. Sixty years ago. Oh, my goodness. The mountain that we had climbed. You could say to yourself, well, we have a perfect marriage. Well, perfect people do not exist. Only Jesus, who is perfect, exists. Only He doesn't make any mistakes. Only He, we are human beings, and even though He comes to sit on the throne of our heart, even though He comes to our hearts and our minds, and works with us daily, still, He's God and we are not. Still, we learn every step of each day. When we go through something, if you don't learn from it, then you're doing yourself a wrong. If you don't learn that you don't go this way and you shouldn't do that, and you this is the only way and this is what you should do, if you don't learn that, you have no discernment, no common sense. You're led probably sometimes like a lot of men and women, not just women. You, you ride the roller coaster. She loves me. She loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. What she said loves me. What he did loves me not. Oh, you just ride that roller coaster of emotions. Because you see, without realizing it, you've made that other person your God. The sun shines and sets on her or him. And all day long, that's all you think about, is being with them. Well, you got to grow up sometime. You have to grow up and see things as they are sometime. And when the first 12 years in your marriage, at least, is without God, <laughs> growing up is a near and a possibility. So after four nervous breakdowns by the time I was 24 years old, finally, Jesus Christ entered into my life. And from that time on, my life began to change. He took me out of the uh, just darkest of dark things in the sense of not being able to see, not being able to understand, not being able to know. And he put me into a whole new world. And that world was Christianity. And that was the worst world that I think I ever had been through. For everybody that said they loved Jesus did not. Everybody lied. Everybody cheated. Everybody stole. Everybody did everything from top to bottom. At least in the different churches that I went through, through for a while until I grew up to understand that not everybody was like that. Not every, past, every pastor or pastor's wife, uh, preacher or teacher or whoever, not everybody was like that. It took a while before I learned that because everywhere I turned, as bad as my life was, it could not compare me with the disappointment and the pain of knowing that it was only lip service. When they said, I love you, they kissed you on the cheek and worked against you behind your back. Oh, they, they didn't think you would ever know because, you see, it was all before God. But you know what? God does not work against himself. I went into churches that they literally devoured their young. They'd see them coming, and they would be prepared and ready to rip and tear them apart for them to never for one moment believe they could ever have Jesus Christ without them. 
so that they could never, everything that they used in the word was to rip that life apart and prove to them they did not have Jesus Christ without them. That they had to be a member of that church, a member of that doctrine. That they had to be or they were nothing. They were outcasts because they separated themselves. They didn't want any parts of the gossip. They didn't want any parts of the cheating. They didn't want any parts of the deception. They didn't want any parts of every time a, a woman walked in without a husband, she became a target. If she was even a least bit good looking, every man looked at her as a target. And you say, oh no, that, you know, you're, no, you don't know what you're talking about if you don't know that. You don't know what you're talking about if you don't know that it takes one tiny, tiny little dot of compromise and corruption. One tiny little dot of making room for sin in order to blossom into a full-blown hypocrite. It takes a few years, like I said before, nothing ever happens overnight. You don't make decisions overnight. If a person decides to destroy someone else, it festered for a long period of time before, and they get tempted and get tempted and get tempted until they look at that other person and they think that other person just makes them sick. They watch them in church get blessed. And they know the blessing's not on them. They can feel it. And they can feel it on that one. And it makes them so jealous. Instead of striving to get the same blessing by dying to self, they blame that other one. They have to be working it wrongly. I wouldn't be suffering like this. I would have more of Jesus than them because I've been here 20 years. They just started. I remember walking into an eye doctor's office and I barely said a few words to him about the Lord. But he knew I was saved. How he knew, I have no idea. And he said, what gets me about you people? (laughs) And I thought, Okay, I don't know where he's coming from about you people. What gets me is as I have had Jesus Christ all of my life. I don't know any other way. Now, this is a man who did not live the gospel. And I've had him with me uh, for so many years. And someone like you comes along and you just discovered him. So you make him the most important thing in your life. Nothing else matters to you but him. But you see, I know better than that. I know how to live the way God wants me to. I can go as I choose, do as I But you see, you can't. Because you're, you're just discovered there is God. I don't know where he got that because I didn't talk to him. And I'm sure no one in my family talked to him. And I'm positive not my friends. It is just something that he felt he needed to say. I don't know what it was about me that made him think he had to say that. I didn't try to tell him any different. I didn't argue with him. You know why? I didn't know enough. I refused to allow my mouth to talk about something that I didn't know. I refuse to be used to argue and fight over something. I had no power to convince someone else. I kept my mouth shut. I wasn't tempted not to. I just did. I didn't know any better. And I walked away from that man feeling very sad because of all the things that he ever learned in church, he did not learn 
the love of Christ. Now, I did not know and understand all of that, what made me so sad about him. But as I grew, I realized that's what was wrong. That's what was missing, is the love of Christ. From the day that I got married, and a telephone call comes in, begging my mother to stop the wedding. He wanted to marry me. I could have had my choice, but I chose this one because this was the first real man I had ever met. And you say, well, I had four brothers. Brothers, I, I would say two of them I really respected even to this day. Two of them didn't, did, didn't mix well with the truth. I had two, I think, blessings from God as brothers. And I had one sister who, without my understanding, I don't even want to go there. My only hope is that she's with the Lord. But I came from a different background than the one I married, completely different. I lived in the slums in a city. He lived on a farm. I was raised being locked up. He was able to roam free, go where he chose for as many hours as he wanted. I wasn't permitted to do that. I always told him, you're very rich. You, ought, you got to go out and play. You had someone to talk to. If you wanted a strawberry, you could pick wild ones. If you wanted something sweet, you could pick even a crab apple, which was better than having nothing. They knew what candy bars were. I didn't. I think that's why when I got to be in high school, I spent all my lunch money buying candy bars and eating them before I got home because I didn't know what it was like to enjoy that. <clears throat> I think, and I very seldom use I think, but I think my life was made to tell you I believe in that, in the hopes that when you're feeling bad, that you don't have anything, that you're thankful because you have him. In the hopes that you think you're suffering trouble, that you realize it's nothing compared to what it's like to live without him. I lived for 32 years without him, and that was horrible. It wasn't a life. It was great darkness of one horror after another. And it's no way, no way can it compare to what children are going through today. No way. My life was good compared to what children of today have. At least I wasn't sold into sex slavery. At least I wasn't, well, I, I can't say I wasn't in, uh, in slavery of any kind because, I mean, if you take a, a nine-year-old and lock them up in a bathroom and, I mean, in the basement and you don't let them out until they have all the clothes for eight people, including all the jeans and everything, all washed and hung, <laughs> I don't think that's not child slavery. <laughs> or you get locked in the bathroom where you have a bathtub to rinse and you have a wringer washer and you have to go through all of that. And you don't get uh, get allowed out until you're done. You don't get to eat. You don't get to anything until you are done. 
and perhaps your mother was beaten so bad that she can't even get up out of bed to help you. So therefore, what I had happened to me, I know with all my heart, is nothing compared to what children are gone through. Nothing. Now that's sad. Because we live in what is supposed to be a Christian world. And the first compromise of Christianity is a betrayal of Christ. Where you believe that you can still have him and never live him. Where you believe that he is going to take you into heaven in spite of of daily doing evil to anyone, let alone children. Where you can take the word and twist it and turn it to your own purpose and make it sound good. Where you could look at others and think you are above them because you know how to read that Bible. And oh, of course, you asked Jesus to come into your heart. But when he knocked on the door, you wouldn't let him in. Because you see, the first thing he would teach you is, pick up your cross, die to self, and follow me. But you didn't go there. You went and used the cross to obtain what you wanted. Used his name to get what you want. Used the manipulation of the word to make it sound like God was with you. A true believing Christian knows better. They know you can't manipulate God. You can't make him what you want. And they know in the end you will stand before him. You will just stand before him and be known the way you are known. I was fortunate. Oh, I suffered so many things with alcoholism, with all of these things. But you know what? He delivered me out of them all. Even to a place as I think last year, a year before last, when I I was taken, well, uh, not year before last. It has to be a a few more years in that because time flies. When I can remember being and taking about 20 pills and suffering digoxin poisoning, suffering uh, I, reactions to ibuprofen, suffering reactions to morphine and oxycodone and, and, and other, so many, so many allergy reactions, not being able to take anything for pain, having uh, to have medicine for blood pressure, up, down, in, out, having to take medicine for, for blood thinner, that the allergy reaction to it caused a hematoma in this eye, and it broke it, it burst it clear across and put a hole in it. So, <laughs> losing my hair, losing my memory, losing everything, only God took a hold of my life and kept me and held me steady and brought all things back to my remembrance. So much so that my heart and my mind wanted desperately to do that for you. <laughs>